Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, just going to start right away. Maybe more people will trickle in. Um, so where we are in the book. Uh, the doctrine of elements had two parts, the transcendental logic and the transcendental aesthetic. And the transcendental logic has two parts, analytic and the dialectic. And the transcendental dialectic has two parts. The uh, concepts of pure reason and the, so actually in the table of contents, this is called the dialectical inferences of pure reason. In the, the section itself, I think the title is something like the procedure of reason as this dialectical inferences, but anyway, I'm just gonna write dialectical inferences. of pure reason. And then that has three parts, the paralogisms, the antinomy, and the ideal. So we finished, I talked about paralogisms last time, and today the reading was from the antinomy. Now, the antinomy is actually a really long section. Um, uh, that is, uh, it, can, it, it contains, or I guess it's a chapter officially. It's a chapter that contains nine long sections. And the actual antinomies are in are all in the second section, which is called the antithetic of pure reason. So, like the other parts, uh, well, there's some introductory stuff that was also part of the reading for today. Um, and then after that, there's a long discussion about this including uh some so some of the reading for next the reading for next time is going to be from the uh solution solution of the cosmological idea of the totality of whatever <laughs> which is a later part of the antinomy um but so uh um, so it's actually, the structure is much more complicated than the structure of the paralogisms. Um, but, uh, you know, in that part, I guess, kind of, you know, blow this up, section two, the antithetic of pure reason has four parts that the four antinomies um i mean yeah the, the title of the section the whole is antinomy of pure reason but then each one of these things is called the antinomy of pure reason in x so is there i don't know if it's really right to say there are four antinomies or there's one antinomy in four parts so, but anyway but it's First, second, third, fourth, and the assigned reading is only the the third antinomy plus that introductory stuff. The third antinomy is the antinomy of cause and effect. Um, and so, like, first of all, uh, it's, I mean, it's kind of a continuation of the stuff we were discussing in the second analogy. Um, why is the second analogy and the third antinomy? Because in the antinomies here, we're going down the 
the second column of my in my table of categories, right? My vertical horizontal table of categories. We're going down the second column, quantity, quality, relation, and then the category we get in the second column under relation is cause and effect. Whereas in the analogies, we're going across this row, right? So the first analogy is substance, the second is cause and effect, and the third is uh, community or commercium, right? So, um, but anyway, these, you know, it is about the, time, the same stuff we were discussing in the second analogy. Um, and uh, it's also, again, is a very famous, and I think uh, in this case, probably um, rightly a subject of a lot of interest because it's the place in the theoretical philosophy where Kant discusses the possibility of freedom. Um, right? One side of the antinomy is that uh, there's only natural causation according to the laws of nature. And the other is that there's another kind of causation, causation through freedom. Um, so if we only have time to read one of them, uh, you know, uh, that's why I decided to do this. That, you know, the others are really interesting. Uh, fourth antinomy, so the, the first one, Right, the first, well, I guess, I mean, there's a list of them in the introductory section, so you should have seen what that is. But basically, the, the first one is about uh, the quantity of the world, and specifically whether it has a beginning in time and whether it has a limit in space. The second one is about the divisibility of matter, whether there's anything simple in matter or whether it's infinitely divisible. Um, the third one, as it just says, cause and effect. And the fourth one is about necessity and contingency. Um, um, whether there's anything necessary, absolutely necessary in nature or everything is contingent. Um, okay, so, um, so before I start discussing the third antinomy, I'm going to discuss the antinomies in general. Hopefully, I wrote here, if getting late, skip on to third antinomy. Hopefully, I wrote that early enough. All right. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to talk about the antinomies in general. Or the antinomy, yeah. Um, so first of all, even more in general, right? Remember what's supposed to be going on here in the transcendental dialectic as a whole. We have these three transcendental ideas. Um, these ideas are the concept of an. Uh, unconditional explanation, an object that would provide an unconditional explanation of all judgments, or that would guarantee the existence of an unconditional explanation for all judgments. Um, and, uh, you know, These are supposed to correspond to the three types of syllogism, that is to the three types of major premise, specifically with respect to the relation of the major premise, right? Is it categorical, hypothetical, or disjunctive? Because those are the three different ways that um, you can uh, explain something by subsuming it under a condition because those are the three different ways that a rule can depend on a condition. And basically, right, like the way I've tried to explain it is that although I have trouble with the details of this, but I still think it's right.
The categorical explanation is an explanation by subsuming something under an internal condition. A hypothetical, ex uh, um, the explanation in a hypothetical syllogism, it works by subsuming something under an external condition for a rule. And the explanation in a disjunctive syllogism works by um, the fact that all external conditions must add up to an internal condition, so to speak. Um, and, you know, this, so this is also related to um, explanation by um, via the nature of the subject. Um, um, this by relation to other actual things and this by relation to all possible things. So I talked somewhat, I mean, as best I could last time about, but there's, there's definitely more to say about this, but about the way like we get from the condition being the subject of the judgment in the major premise of a categorical syllogism to the object that I reason is looking for as a guarantee being the subject of all representations, right? That is the, the um the transcendental self um regarded as given purely in thought without intuition the luminal self um so i'm not going to go back into that <laughs> um this i think is actually uh easier to understand right like the external conditions that um explain my judgment um are uh um our judgment you know like so if my judgment is a is b and i'm going to explain it With this kind of hypothetical syllogism, um, then, you know, here I'm uh, uh, relying on some other object in general, different than A, some object C. And I'm saying that if that object is in a certain state, then A is in a certain state. And that's basically the form of a causal explanation. Right, which is, I mean, which is why this relation of judgment is related to the category of cause and effect in the in the metaphysical deduction. So when we're looking for a guarantee that there always will be such an explanation, we're uh, um, we're looking for the explanation in somewhere in the. Uh, other actual objects and their states um, that will make it necessary that there is an explanation like this for any given judgment. And um, of course, we can't look for that in some particular portion, right? Because um, uh, that, you know, whatever particular part of the other actual things we choose is only going to be so good at explaining judgments. It's it's not going to provide an absolute guarantee that every judgment can be explained. And so uh, we look in the totality of the actual objects.
Um, so, I mean, that means that the, um, the, the transcendental idea here is a little weird. Um, um, it's the idea of phenomena, but taken as a kind of totality that could only be given um, to uh, an intellectual intuition. Now, you might say, hold on a second, phenomena are objects of uh, sensible intuition. How could the totality of them be given to an intellectual intuition? And the basic answer is, it couldn't. That's why I get a contradiction, <laughs> right? I mean, in other words, that's why in these two cases, Kant says we get a false conclusion, right? like an invalid inference to a con conclude. Well, I shouldn't say it's. We get an unjustified, an unjustifiable conclusion, right? A conclusion about an object that we can't actually refer to, um, uh, but we don't get a contradiction. We get only one conclusion about it. But in this case, sorry, in this case, in the second case, we get a contradiction because we're trying to look at the exact same object in two incompatible ways. Um, that's like fundamentally what's going on throughout the antinomies. Um, okay, so um, more detail, how does this work? Well, I mean, first of all, I'm gonna talk, of course, I wanna talk about the word antinomy. Um, so, um, so this part, right? Namas is the Greek word for law. Right, also seen in autonomy, which means self legislation, um, and probably other words. All right. Um, um, now, um, so an antinomy is a contradiction in the law. Um, and that's how Kant explains it. The antinomy which discloses itself in the application of laws is for our limited wisdom, the best criterion of the legislation. And as the um, footnote here indicates, Kemp Smith's footnote, the word he's translating as legislation is this. So this is a German word, but it's obviously like a um, it's not a normal German word. It's like, a, oh, sorry, you can't see what I wrote. Right. This is the word that Kemp Smith translates here as legislation. Um, right? This is just basically a Greek word, you know, written in German. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, wait, let me finish reading the quote before I go back to talking about that. The antinomy which discloses itself in the application of laws is for our limited wisdom, the best criterion of the legislation that has given rise to them. Mm 
Right. So the the analogy here, the idea is that if uh, you know, in a literal case where the legislators have made a law, and we want to know is it consistent or is there a hidden inconsistency in it, then the best criterion is um, to see whether judges can apply it consistently <laughs> or whether. Uh, in some cases, they can provide perfectly good arguments for both sides based on the law. If um, 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 in particular, right, uh, because you might think that doesn't necessarily mean the legislation is inconsistent. That might just mean it's vague or something, right? It's ambiguous. Um, but if you imagine um, that the, the kind of argument they make for both sides is a proof by contradiction, right? So, like we have our case and we want to know if the verdict is A or not A. So we say, well, suppose the verdict is A, then blah, 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 not A, contrary to what was assumed. That's a proof by contradiction. Right? Therefore, not A. Now, I mean, like so far, this is just an indirect way of proving not A. But now suppose you can do this. Okay, assume not A, blah, 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 and you get A. <laughs> so uh, this means that, that you have an inconsistent premise, right? You've just you've pro you've proven a contradiction. This is uh This is how the argument for the Russell paradox works. <laughs> this and this is how all the arguments in the antinomies work, right? This, the 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 two sides. If 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 you pay attention to those, like two side by side arguments in each antinomy, um, you'll see that they don't directly prove their side. What they do is to assume the other side for purpose of argument and then show that it's absurd. Um, right, so that's the analogy, um, and um, there's one other thing to say about this, which is that, okay, so this is, I mean, I guess the Greek word that that Kant is trying to write in German here would be something like like the science of legislation or something like that right where you have to fill in just like physics in greek is hey physike episteme right and the word physic comes from the physike part um, and similar for logic and so on, so on. So I mean, uh, as far as I can tell, this Greek word isn't doesn't actually occur in ancient Greek sources, right? So Kant is kind of making it up. But I mean, it's it's the word you would use in the sense that you know the so the word for legislation in Greek is this. Um. um and you know, the word for a legislature is a legislator is uh, um, right, namathesia, namathetes, right? So it's legislation is namas plus thesis, right? Like, um, placing or 
positing. That's where you get the term positive law, right? A positive law is a law that's been legislated. Um, so, uh, and that's why the two sides of each antinomy are called thesis and antithesis. Right, something is posited and the opposite or legislated and the opposite is posited or legislated. So there's a contradiction in the law. Um, another, uh, okay, so, so like this is mostly just about the terminology here. Yeah, but I am. Anyway, um, so, uh, uh, but in any case, whatever the terminology, again, we're going to have like a principle. Ray, reason is the faculty of principles. There's going to be reason is going to set forth a certain principle that must be true. Um, and uh, the principle is going to turn out, I mean, I guess what is the principle? The principle itself is a disjunction, I guess. Maybe that's not a good way to think about it. But what's, what happens in the case of each antinomy is that, so again, I guess the, the principle is, maybe this is how I should write it. The principle is, totality of conditions is or contains an absolute condition, an unconditioned condition. Right, I mean, that's the actual, that's like the direct conclusion of the dialectical inference. There's an, there's an unconditioned object somehow given in the totality of conditions for any given empirical fact. And then, uh, the question is, like, between these two alternatives, where is it? <laughs> we know it has to be there in the totality of conditions. Um, and the two alternatives are, it's in the entire totality, or it's in a part of it. Right, so in the case of each antinomy, we assume, so this is the thesis. If the order of thesis and antithesis is not arbitrary, the thesis is always the, trying to prove that the condition is, in, is somewhere in the series, whereas the antithesis is always trying to prove that the condition is the whole infinite series. The unconditioned condition. Um, and moreover, the thesis is always the good side. <laughs> right? Like the thesis is the like religious side, basically. The world had a beginning in time. Um, there is a simple in in the world. There is which uh um implies that uh, there's something in the world that's not body, basically. 
Um, there is freedom. There is an absolute necessity in the right. Like this is this is supposed to be the good side, and this is the bad side. Right, the side of saying that the world is internal in past time, that it's uh, that it contains nothing, that bodies consist of nothing but body, no matter how far down you go, that there is no freedom, uh, and that. Uh, um, um, the the necessary thing is the world as a whole. Um, so it's like as Kant says in the preface, um, if if you let these these two sides fight it out, um, uh, and one of them is the one who's who's allowed to speak last is going to win, then basically this one is going to win. Right. So like if Spinoza comes and says this one, then Spinoza's not going to be given the last word because he's on the bad side. <laughs> right. But as Kant also says in the preface, uh, I think this is in the preface, or was it in the beginning of the dialect? I don't remember where it is. But anyway, he says, you know, but let's let's um let's set this up fairly. And look into what each side has to say. And he says, you know, in the end, we may find that the two sides realize they don't disagree about anything or whatever. And they, they may part as friends. Right. So that's that's Kant's project here. Um, and as I said, the, these two sides always work. So the thesis will say, you know, assume the world has no beginning in time, then blah, 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 which is absurd. Therefore, the world has a beginning in time. And the antithesis will say, assume the world has a beginning in time, then blah, 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 which is absurd. Therefore, the world has no beginning in time. And together, they show that this principle was, was inconsistent. That is, if you think both of these arguments are good, which Kant does, right? Kant claims that um, there's no mistake in these arguments except the initial mistake of thinking that there could be an unconditioned condition in the world. Um, okay, like another way of describing what happens here is that we're following the skeptical method. Right, the method of the ancient skeptics. Um, who uh, wanted people to suspend judgment on everything. <laughs> So for any philosophical question, they would give an argument for one side and an argument for the other side. And they'd say, uh, you know, see, these cancel each other out. You should suspend judgment. Um, it's also, as I argue when I teach 100B, is basically Descartes' method in the first meditation. And well, as Descartes himself says, actually, in the, in the discourse on the method, that he followed the skeptical method, although not with the same aim as the skeptics, right? His aim wasn't that you should suspend judgment on everything, but rather that you should get rid of everything uncertain and start with something certain. So similarly, Kant here is, is uh, using the skeptical method as, you know, as he says, um, this is on B452 on page 396. Um, well, actually, I mean, he, he introduces the term skeptical method up here, right? This is B451 on page 395. 
This procedure, I say, may be entitled the skeptical method. Right, and then on the next page, what I was about to read before. But it is only for transcendental philosophy that this skeptical method is essential. Um, so again, Kant is like Descartes, Kant is using this skeptical method, although his aim isn't skepticism, right? So like his aim isn't that you should suspend judgment. I mean, like obviously his overall aim isn't skepticism to suspend judgment about everything. But even in this individual case, his aim isn't that you should suspend judgment between these two. Right. Rather, his aim is that you should realize the mistake that, that gave rise to this. Um, and he explains the reason it's essential in transcendental philosophy. He says that since uh, we can't test these principles empirically, um, and we can't even test them the way we can test moral principles by like imagining a case and seeing if we can get a consistent result. Um, uh, or supposing a case, maybe imagine isn't the right word there. But in any case, we can't do that here either. How are we gonna like, figure out that there's something wrong with a transcendental principle? Well, only by showing the contradiction. Now, I mean, that makes sense, except um, what about the paralogisms and the ideal? So there we were able to find a mistake in a transcendental principle without showing a contradiction. So I'm not sure what to do with that explanation. There's, there's something I'm missing here, I think but I'm not sure what, um, um, but it's, uh, so there's something special about the case of a hypothetical syllogism that requires this skeptical method. Um, so, I mean, I don't know exactly how to explain that, but, um, but it must be related to whatever it is that makes these contradictions come out in this case and not in the other cases. Um, so, um, and that somehow is related, right? So, I mean, I gave a really brief explanation for that before which i think is was right as far as it goes but not very detailed right i just said uh look um we're trying to look at the same thing as both a phenomenon and a noumenon basically <laughs> that's where the contradiction is going to come from but um but obviously there's a lot more detail to it to how the contradiction comes out um and um i mean it's somehow related to the confusing point about the series. So, okay, so, it's the best place to start, I guess so. So Kant says, we're gonna look for uh, the unconditioned in the ascending series of conditions, not in the descending series. 
Now, this like ascending series and descending series terminology is based on the idea that we have a series of syllogisms. And they're written <laughs> vertically, right? So that's why you go up in one direction and down in the other direction, you know, and here's Here's the one we started with. And again, assuming I'm right, we want the syllogism before that to have C is D as its conclusion. And we want it to also be a hypothetical syllogism, right? So, um, so obviously we have to have something like if E is F, C is D, E is F, Therefore, oops. Therefore, C is D, and then we plug this in as the minor premise of the next one. And then, so the ascending series, we just keep doing that, right? That you can write an infinite row of these going up, uh, and or column, I guess. And then on the other hand, uh, the descending series is that we're going to use A is B as the condition in some new syllogism. Yeah. And then, right, this is gonna keep going. So Kant says, you know, um, what reason demands is the totality of the ascending series, right? That is to, to have a, a full explanation of this conclusion it's not enough to have this, but you also have to explain this, and therefore you also have to explain this, and so on and so forth. But Kant says, on the other hand, this conclusion is fine without any of the descending series, right? So, like, reason doesn't demand this. I mean, it's reason is like, fine, see how far you can go. <laughs> but it doesn't demand anything about it. Now, I mean, so far, so good, but then somehow this series of syllogisms is related to the series of conditions in the world. I mean, what I was saying before, like, I guess maybe made that sound more obvious than it is. Um, so like, if we think, because we're getting ready for the third antinomy of the series of causes and effects, Actually, maybe that's easier to understand. Maybe I should say, so like, if you think of the first antinomy, the part about time. So the part about time says that, um, um, as Kant understands it, the part about time says there has to be an like absolute totality in the series of past times. Because the past times are the ascending series. But the future times, Kant says, you know, the, the question about whether the world has an end in time or continues indefinitely into the future, he says, is like an arbitrary question. It's not a demand of reason that we consider that. In other words, reason doesn't demand an absolute totality on that side. So meaning that somehow the series of times is the same as this series of syllables. Um, now, um, remember the point I made about this series of syllogisms in general. Um, Namely, that the dialectical inference of pure reason doesn't take us up that series. I shouldn't have erased it, maybe. But right, the dialectical inference of, of reason isn't like a long thing that goes through this whole series. The dialectical inference of reason is once, first of all, it's obviously not any of the members of this series, because as I pointed out, the members of this series are, are going this direction towards our conclusion, A is B. 
But the dialectical inference is going back from some empirical fact like A is B to unconditioned. So it certainly is not one of the syllogisms in this series. But also, there's no series here. It's one step. Right, so I pointed that out in the case of the um, paralogisms, and it's true here too. So I, um, I read this before, but I'm gonna go back to it, uh, especially because I got kind of confused about it before. So this is on um, B525, and it's page 443 in Kemp Smith. The whole antinomy of pure reason rests upon the dialectical argument. If the conditioned is given, the entire series of all its conditions is likewise given. Objects of the senses are given as conditioned, therefore, etc. Um, so what I got confused about when I was reading this before is um, that so in a hypothetical syllogism, the minor premise is supposed to be the same as the antecedent of the major premise. Right? Again, the, the form is... If C is D, then A is B. Then the minor premise is C is D, and therefore the conclusion is A is B. When I look at this, and um, by the way, I think this passage is not part of the assigned reading, but I'm reading it anyway. All right. <laughs> um, so when I look at this syllogism, if the conditioned is given, the entire series of all its conditions is likewise given. So I expect the minor premise to be the conditioned is given, but instead the minor premise is objects of the senses are given as conditioned. So this last time I was like, wait, what's going on here? But I think actually the explanation is pretty simple. Um, rather than giving my, the minor premise, Kant is giving something which immediately implies the minor premise. Um, like uh, in addition to syllogisms or inferences of reason, Kant says thinks, and I mean, he didn't make this up, but Kant says, there are also immediate inferences, which he calls inferences of the understanding, right? And an example of an immediate inference would be from uh, like, this A is B to some A is B, right? That is from a singular judgment to uh, um, particular judgment with the same concepts. And the reason this is an immediate inference is we don't bring in a mediating condition. Right? We just go straight from this to this. Kant calls this an inference of the understanding. And that's basically like what's been filled in here, right? So, or I mean, what's been like left unsaid here. So that since objects of the senses are given as conditioned, the conditioned is given. <laughs> that is, something is given as conditioned. Uh, um, right. So the, so the syllogism really is, if the conditioned is given, the entire series of all its conditioned is likewise given, but the conditioned is given, therefore, right? But the, but the reason he didn't write it that way is because he wants to call your attention to the fact that the condition that is given is something empirical, right? The condition that's given is some empirical judgment or the truth of some empirical judgment or something like that. Um, okay, so again, that syllogism only had one step, right? Something is given as conditioned, therefore, the unconditioned, the unconditioned is given.
Um, so, you know, and what I said before is there's no series here. There is a logical series here, right? That is the logical employment of the understanding does go through a series of syllogisms to get to this conclusion. It doesn't start with the unconditions. <laughs> um, but it does go through a series of, so th there is an ascending series here. It's not just one step. Um, and then, as I also mentioned before, in the correct, like regulative use of the ideas, again, there's going to be a series because the correct use of this cosmological idea um, is, and here, I guess, here maybe it is easier to understand in the case of cause and effect with the third antinomy, right? Like, the 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 cosmological idea of a totality of the conditions of an empirical judgment with respect to cause is um, um, has a correct regulative use in that it tells us that whenever we find something is true, we should look for the cause. And there again is a series, and that series goes in this direction, basically. Right? Find this, look for the cause, look for the cause of that, look for the cause of that, look for the cause of that, but it doesn't go to the unconditioned. So so far, this is true for all parts of the transcendental dialectic. Um but in the antinomies and only in the antinomies, there's also a series um, Yeah, so actually, maybe I shouldn't have used this example from it because I, I was already bringing in both maybe. but you know, let's say if this is the, if this is the paralogism, right? It says like, okay, look for an internal explanation of this. Okay, look for an internal explanation of that. Look for, um, um, so this is a series of explanations, but there isn't a series of objects. They're all internal conditions. It's the same object who's we're looking for, like, so to speak, a deeper and deeper understanding of its nature. Right? Cinnabar is red because it's this, but why is it that? Because it's this. Well, why is it that? Because it's this. Um, whereas in the antinomies and only in the antinomies, the object of the category that we're using is it's itself, uh, or the category we're using necessarily represents its object as part of a series. Right, so this is, Kant says this, this is uh, B436, Uh, on page 386 in Kemp Smith. Right, so first he says what we already know from the introduction to the transcendental dialectic. The transcendental ideas are thus in the first place simply categories extended to the unconditioned, right? That was the thing about how the transcendental ideas themselves don't represent an object. And so when reason tries to get them to represent an object, they can only do it by, by like um, taking over the categories and trying to use them. <laughs> um, so they're simply categories extended to the end condition and can be reduced to a table arranged according to the fourfold. Kemp Smith inserted fourfold, which is 
correct, but why insert it? Anyway, according to the fourfold headings of the latter. In the second place, not all categories are fitted for such employment, but only those in which the synthesis constitutes a series of conditions subordinated to, not coordinated with one another and generative of a condition. And then he like kind of like after that, he kind of um, goes through various categories. So in this in, in in this sentence, he's calling this is one of the places where he's calling those four things the headings of the categories, and he's calling the twelve moments the categories, right? So he says, you know, um, well, first of all, we're going to have to take categories from from the fourfold headings. Then he says, we're not going to take every category because only some categories are fitted to represent a series. And then he kind of goes through various categories, although not all of them, and says, like, which ones are fitted to represent a series? Um, but, um, but again, although he doesn't, although he doesn't say that, it seems clear that he's going down that second column, right? And so that we could have predicted which ones are going to yield a series. Now, I mean, That's especially clear in the third row relation. Where you have substance accident, cause effect. And community. Um, it may seem strange that community doesn't have a correlate the way substance and accident and cause and effect do. I think um, that, and sometimes Kant says this, and in some of his lectures and his like uh, earlier writings, he, uh, or notes, he uses this as the name for, for this category, that the correlation is between whole and part. Now, I mean, the reason he doesn't officially say that in the, in the particular pure reason is but he has totality up here. And of course, right, totality means wholeness. So this is about whole and part. But the truth is they're they're really both about whole and part. It's, but this is about, well, as he would say, mathematical wholes, and this is about dynamical wholes. Or uh, in other words, this is about a whole of parts that are just sitting next to each other. Whereas this is about a whole of parts that are somehow like require each other, right? And that it's, and they're, they're related to each other by cause and effect. Um, so anyway, you know, on the one hand, um, it's pretty clear that this is the one. I mean, he goes into long arguments, or not that one, but he goes into arguments about why we can't get a series here or a series here. But I mean, just looking at it, it's pretty clear that this is the one that's about a series of objects. Um, and the reason it's about a series of objects is because it's about externality. Right. I, Remember, the reason I keep correlating these with inner and outer is that that's what they're correlated on the table of concepts of reflection and the amphibity. Remember that? Right. So we expect these to have something to do with inner and outer. And sure enough, they do. Right. So um, the cause is an outer condition, an external condition of the effect. Um, and that's why there's a series, right? Because the we go from the effect to something else outside of the effect, namely its cause. And that from that to something else outside of that cause, namely its cause, and so on and so forth. Um, but the, uh, the same is, you know, basically true in these other cases, plurality, negation, Again, you have to understand negation as division here. And I talked a little bit last time about why that makes sense. But, um, 
And here, I mean, this category is existence, but it's existence placed between possibility and necessity. So that is kind of understands it here as contingency. And contingency also has this, right? All these things, plurality, right? Means that, that you know, the parts are outside each other. The object is outside itself. It's self different. And that's why you get a series. Um, division, I guess that's kind of obvious. And here, like you have to think of contingency as contingency on something. That's why you get a series, right? What is it contingent on? Now, I mean, you might ask what's the difference between this and that? And I have to tell you that I don't completely understand, although it seems like I should be able to understand. But anyway, we're not reading the fourth anthem to me, so I won't have to say anything about that after this. All right. So, uh, uh, I mean, because like, I never talked about this, but uh, it was part of the reading. I, the when he discusses uh, the uh, third postulate, the postulate of necessity in the uh, analytic of principles, he he says that the only kind of necessity that's found in phenomena is the necessity of cause and effect. Rel the relative nece the necessity of the effect relative to its cause. So these are somehow kind of the same thing, but we're looking at it from two different kinds of points of view or something like that. Okay, so each one of these second column categories involves some kind of series of objects. Um, and you might think, Okay, well that's interesting, but it's but it's just this is just some other series, right? Like what does it have to do with that logical series I was talking about? And yet you have to say that they're the same because um because again, Kant says we're only interested in the ascending series, and he means both the ascending series of syllogisms and the series of prior conditions, right? In the case, in in the case of the first antinomy, right, or at least on the time side, it's literally the prior conditions. Um, So, I mean, it's possible that this identification of the two series is itself part of the transcendent illusion here. Um, I mean, here's something that Kant says that sounds kind of like this, that this is on B443, no, wait, is it? Four forty three on page three ninety one. What reason is really seeking in this serial aggressively continued synthesis of conditions is solely the unconditioned.
so so maybe it's really just a mistake in the sense that right what reason is really looking for is that one step thing but because uh it's looking for it in the wrong place within the object uh, it finds a series there and tries to use the totality of that series as the unconditioned but it's really like um Um, it's really confusing the search for the beginning of a series of syllogisms with the search for the beginning of a series of objects and that like it shouldn't have looked there at all or should we say as and this was kind of what i was trying to say before that uh no they really somehow in this case they are the same in the sense that um the conditions that the, the series of syllogisms are going to use, uh, you know, really do, really are the series of conditions in the object. I'm not sure which is right. Um, Um, okay, but anyway, that is what reason is doing here. Reason is looking for um, in the series of um, in the series that's defined by a certain category. I mean, one one way Kant will say this is that the category that category is for the exponent of this series. Where exponent is not using exponent for the same way we use it now. The exponent of the series is like the 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 rule that produces the series as you go from one step to another. So, um, right, so in the case of cause and effect, obviously the, the series is a series of causes. So we have cause, 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 and then in the end we have an effect. And reason uh, is looking for an unconditioned external explanation in this series. So, like again, it's still it's still the case. Reason doesn't look for it by going back through this series. Right, it's not like we start with some empirical fact like cinnabar is red, and then reason looks for its cause. And the cause of that cause and the cause of that cause, trying to find the unconditioned somewhere in the series. Uh, it's uh, right, I mean, because again, this has to be a guarantee for any empirical judgment that it will have an unconditioned explanation. So it must be something about a series of causes like this as such. Again, that's why that's why it's a transcendental idea. It's just about objects as such without inquiring into their particular empirical character. So, um, 
And so reason says, well, they, you know, there's only two alternatives. Either somewhere in this series is an uncaused cause or an unconditional cause. which is the uh, beginning of the series. And that must be true for every effect. So like um, the easiest way to do that and the minimum that the thesis is gonna try to prove here is that all causal chains in the world go back to one first cause that was unconditioned. But it could also in principle be accomplished by having some causal series in the world have, have their own unconditioned causes. Um, so anyway, that's the thesis. Whereas the antithesis says that the unconditioned condition of the effect is the infinite series of causes taken as a whole. So like in both cases, we, we end up getting having the series taken as a whole, like as a totality. Um, but in the first case, it's a finite totality. And in the second case, it's an infinite totality. And the, the, the argument for the thesis says this kind of infinite totality uh, doesn't make sense. So there must be a finite totality. And the argument for the antithesis says this kind of finite totality doesn't make sense. So there must be an infinite totality. And Kant says both arguments are right. <laughs> um, neither of these make sense because the initial premise was not consistent. Um, um, so this kind of unconditional, maybe I should say unconditioned cause. This kind of unconditioned cause would be a free cause. Um, Kant also will call it a spontaneous cause. Um, and like, I guess I should say, you know, don't be misled by this. Um, spontaneous doesn't here doesn't mean like uh, kind of happy go lucky or like whatever, right? I mean, it just means it basically means the same thing as unconditioned cause. It means a, a, a cause where uh, there is no external explanation for why it acted and no need of one. Um, um, right, because I mean, if, there, if there's no unconditioned explanation, but we need an unconditioned explanation, then uh, that means that uh, this cause couldn't have acted, right? I mean, it can't act without the needed explanation. I mean, that is, we don't have to know the explanation, but there has to be one um, if it's legitimate to ask for one. So this has to be a cause where, um, where uh, the nature of the cause is such that it's not legitimate to ask, ask for a external explanation of why it acted.
Um, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say like spontaneous. I guess spontaneous means something slightly different. We're just supposed to follow from this. Spontaneous means that it wasn't determined to act by something else. Therefore, it acted on its own. <laughs> I don't know. Are those the same thing or are they slightly different? I'm not sure. It doesn't matter. Anyway, right? This is a cause that acts on its own without anything else determining it to act. Um, so, uh, um, Kant says this is act, that's actually the definition of freedom that's really needed by practical philosophy, by morality, right? He says, you know, freedom means loss of different things. Um, and uh, like on the one hand, it can mean less than this, right? It just means that I wasn't coerced or something, but I was, I was determined by something. Uh, or this cause was determined by something, but it wasn't forced somehow, right? But on the other hand, freedom also uh, means more than this because, um, uh, because just like acting randomly isn't freedom, right? Like you have to spontaneously act according to a principle or something like that. So, uh, um, so but Kant says this is like, um, this is the point where the true like metaphysical difficulty lies in explaining how freedom in this sense is possible. The cause that acts without being determined to act by another cause. So, I mean, the main issue between the thesis and antithesis here, therefore, is actually about divine freedom, right? It's not really about human freedom. Because, as I said, like the all the thesis claims to be able to prove is that um, there's at least one first cause of ev of everything. Um, so human freedom, that is the freedom of, uh, or this, it's an example of the freedom of uh, some uh, ordinary object of experience, so to speak. What I mean by ordinary object of experience, I mean that, like, um, Um, well, what do I mean by this? It's actually not clear what the thesis... I, I think it's supposed to be different from the first antinomy, and I, I think independent of it, right? That is, the, the, the thesis um, is a... I, the, the thesis thinks this can be maintained even if there if the world is internal eternal in prior time so that the uh the first cause would be like a first mover that acts throughout time it doesn't it's not at the start of time um, and to understand that you have to remember that Kant thinks the cause is a substance and the effect is an event that is change in states, change in state of a substance.
Right. So the cause might be the earth and the effect might be the acceleration of a body towards the earth. It's changing its state of motion. Now, um, substance is permanent. That was the conclusion of the first analogy. So this substance was there before the effect happened. Um, but Obviously, it wasn't causing the effect yet because the effect hadn't happened yet. So, that says, therefore, um, the action of the cause is itself an event, or what Kant calls the causality of the cause. So, right, so like, here's the substance. This direction is time, right? So the substance is always here. And here's the effect. So the effect is the change in state of some other substance. So substance two changes its state at this time from like A to not A. And substance one is supposed to be the cause of that change. And Kant says, how does it do that? Well, prior to this, I mean, so it's really not prior. If you read that stuff at the end of the second analogy carefully, you'll see that the, the, this causality is always like simultaneous with the effect. And neither of these changes happens discontinuously the way I'm writing it here. Right, so like the the substance two changes state continuously from one to another, and that starts when substance one starts to change its state. Right, so but anyway, like Kant usually talks about it this way, which is easier to understand even if it's not right, which is that like prior to this happening, there must have been a change in substance one from B to not B. It could be easy enough to think from B to not B to B, but well, uh, from B to not B. And this change here is also an event. And this change is what Kant calls the causality of the cause. Now, so this explains why, like, if there's a if there's a substance, if there's a cause that is a substance that acts spontaneously, it doesn't have to exist before these substances exist. It just has to stay, change its state according to a rule that isn't determined by anything else. Um, so, like, if you think of the outermost sphere in Aristotelian cosmology, I mean, in this case, it is the limit of the world in space. It's not the beginning of the world in time. That's interesting. But anyway, if you think of the outermost sphere in Aristotelian cosmology, it goes around, and for Aristotle, this is a change of state. Uh, it goes around continuously, and because it goes around continuously, everything inside it also goes around. Um, but uh, uh, there's nothing outside of it that's pushing it. Let's say, unless you assume that intellects are efficient causes it. All right. Anyway, that's like a way of understanding this. 
So, um, so, so we're not talking about the eternity of the world and time, we're, but we are talking about the possibility of a spontaneous cause. Um, all right, this was all because I was having trouble explaining what the difference is between You know, it's really not that. I think from this point of view, the difference between uh, finite freedom, like freedom of, even though Kant doesn't talk about it this way, which worries me, but the difference between the, the kind of um, starting everything, divine freedom versus the... Uh, um, starting something, human freedom, is just that. It's whether it's supposed to be at the beginning of every causal series or not. So, all right, this is a long way of getting back to what I was, what I was starting to say, which is that, so in the third antinomy, so like the true interest of reason in this question is because of human freedom. That's what we really need to know, right? That's what we need to know for ethics. But the um, but as far as the third antinomy goes, that's a side issue, right? Like because what they're really arguing about is divine freedom, and therefore the side issue is treated in the observation to the thesis and the observation to the antithesis. Um. So, like, in the observation to the thesis, the thesis side argues that um, given that we understand that we know that there can be such a thing as a spontaneous cause, um, even though we don't know, we don't understand how. Right. So like, actually, both the thesis and the antithesis in the observations concede that the uh, that the side they're arguing for is in some way inconceivable that we can't understand how there can be a spontaneous cause or an infinite series of causes um right an infinite series of causes it like maybe it sounds like that's easy to understand but it's really not like how did it ever get infinitely far to to arrive at now <laughs> Um, uh, isn't that just what an infinite series can't do? You know, whatever. So it's, um, anyway, both sides can see that what they're arguing for is in a certain way incomprehensible, but they say, you know, they both draw the same analogy. They say like, but that shouldn't be a problem. The same thing is true of Newtonian gravitation, right? We know that uh, the like bodies attract each other but the rationalists are right. We don't can't understand how bodies can attract each other. We only know because they do, right? And so the thesis and the antithesis are saying the same thing in this case. And if you say, wait, what do you mean? What's the part where we only know because they do? Again, remember the dialectical inference starts with the objects of the senses are given as conditioned, right? So like we know there are conditioned truths. And the dialectical inference says, therefore the unconditioned is given. So we know it's actual. And uh, if we can't understand how it's possible, well, tough luck, that's the way it goes, right? So so both both the thesis and the antithesis and the observation say that, right? And, and further, further on in the observation, the thesis says, well, um, um, and, you know, once we've admitted one case, there has to be one case where a spontaneous cause is actual, whether we understand how or not, there's nothing to prevent us from thinking that there's other cases, right? And in particular, that every moral agent might be a spontaneous cause. Um, well, 
Whereas the antithesis in the observation says, and look, even if we admitted this kind of unconditioned cause, which we shouldn't, it would have to be outside the world. Um, and uh, I mean, here, I guess it, it means spatio-temporally outside the world. Um, I'm not sure, but anyway, uh, it says, but I mean, certainly, even if I conceded that, I certainly wouldn't agree that there could be spontaneous causes inside the world like human beings, right? So they, so, so they both like kind of um, dig in their heels on the side issue of human freedom. Or I should just dig. They both extend their view in opposite directions to the, the the thesis to say, and therefore we should also accept human freedom in the antithesis to say, and moreover, we should definitely not accept human freedom. Um, Now I haven't, I mean, I haven't said what the arguments on each side are. Um, but, um, I mean, The argument for the antithesis is that um, if this change in the state of the cause doesn't have an explanation, doesn't have a causal explanation, then it isn't really a change in state of the same thing. We can't represent it as a change in state of the same thing. And why not? And if, basically because of the second analogy. I mean, it could basically have just, the antithesis could have just basically cited the second analogy, right? Like the connection of experience requires that every event have a cause. That was the proof of the second analogy. So if there's some events that don't have a cause, then, you know, that's exactly the... The thing we ruled out as not being compatible with reference to an empirical object. Whereas the argument for the thesis basically tries to show that an uh, infinite series of um, explanations is no explanation. Um, so, uh, um, and therefore also claims that the claims that this is also a violation of the second analogy basically because it says that if this event doesn't have a, a if we know that this event is caused by this but we don't know what this event is caused by and we don't really know what this event is caused by And then if there's an infinite series here, that means no matter how far we go, we never really have an explanation. So this whole series basically doesn't contain a causal explanation for that event. So, um, and again, Kant is going to say, well, both of these arguments work. The mistake was in thinking that... Um, we should be looking for an unconditioned, ex a guarantee of an unconditioned explanation somewhere in the object. Um, once you put it there, it's true. It can't be the whole series and it can't be just a part of the series. They're both impossible because everything given an experience is conditioned. <laughs> experience is always conditioned. Um, Okay, there's one more thing to say about this, 
which is about the solution. So we're going to be talking about the solution next time. Um, so uh, um, in the first two antinomies, the mathematical antinomies, that is the ones associated with the mathematical categories of quantity and quality, Kant says that um, the way the contradiction is resolved is um, that the judge dismisses the suit and says, like, neither of you has a case. So it just turned out it was a bad question, right? So, uh, like, does the world have a meaning in time or has the world always existed as internal in prior time? And the answer is um, neither of those things are, we're, we're not capable of um, representing anything by either of those thoughts. Or actually, I mean, it's worse than that. Both of those would be, both of those are absurd. Whereas he says in the two dynamical antinomies, the judge rectifies the pleas of each side to make them consistent with each other. So, I mean, we're going to have to figure out exactly how that works and also why there's a difference between the mathematical and dynamical antinomies. But that means that in this case, the answer is going to be not you're both wrong, but you're both right. <laughs> There is no beginning of the causal series, and yet freedom is possible. Okay, so we'll have to see in what sense it's possible and in what sense there's no beginning to the causal series and so forth. All right, and I will see you uh, a week from today, I guess, because Monday is a holiday. Bye.